Well, hello everyone and a very warm welcome to Grace Church Sandbach uh, this Sunday morning. Uh, really glad you're able to join us and if you don't know me, if it's your first time, I'm Paul and I serve as a pastor here at Grace Church. Let's dive straight in this morning by listening to God in his word. Uh, these words are from the book of Acts, uh, written uh, by Luke, one of Jesus' followers, and uh, 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 this particular sermon that we're reading uh, is from uh, Peter, one of Jesus' close friends. Uh, Peter telling uh, the Jews around him of the Lord Jesus and how Jesus has been raised from the dead. Uh, so Peter says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death, nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Uh, David said about him a thousand years before, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he would, will, was not uh, will not be abandoned to the realm of the dead. Uh, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Those words that, um, uh, that Peter quotes uh, from David. Uh, David wrote those words down, but Peter's point is they couldn't be about David. Uh, David himself uh, did not enjoy that, that thing of his body not seeing decay. David died, David was buried, David's body was still in the tomb. But Jesus, uh, God had promised to David, one of his descendants would sit on the throne forever, would not see decay. And that was the Lord Jesus, uh, God's mystery, God's plan to send the Lord Jesus, who would die for our sin, uh, who would uh, rise from the dead and never see decay again. Uh, what an amazing story. What an amazing true story uh, that is. So let's come now to pray, shall we? Let's pray to God. Loving Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning. Uh, we praise you that you are the God of world history. We rejoice that you are the God who is in control of all things. And we thank you and praise you for your plan of salvation. Uh, the plan that you showed us in part uh, throughout the Old Testament, through the promise made to David, but the plan that you showed in all its, its fullness when your son, the Lord Jesus, came. Uh, Heavenly Father, we praise you that your great plan of history is a plan of salvation for sinners. We confess, Father, we do not deserve to be part of your great story. We deserve to be shut out. We have rebelled against you in so many ways. But we praise you, Father, that your story hinges on the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived and died and was raised 2,000 years ago. Uh, we praise you, Father, that all of the promises of the Old Testament uh, find their fulfilment in Jesus. Uh, we praise you, Father, that Jesus is the better David, the better king, uh, the one who died and yet who rose so that we could live as well. Oh, loving Heavenly Father, please would you help us this morning. Please may your Holy Spirit help us to hear your word, to listen to what you have to say, uh, to take it in, 
And please may your spirit help us to see our King, the risen Lord Jesus, and to delight in him. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now. Uh, we're going to sing a great modern hymn about this amazing mystery uh, that has found its fulfilment, has been revealed in the Lord Jesus. God's great plan of history that came to fulfilment in Jesus. We're going to sing, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. And after that, Chris is going to speak to the children. Uh, Phil will lead us in a time of prayer. And then Helen will read the Bible for us. everyone. I uh, hope you're all doing okay. As you can see I'm just enjoying a little bit of sunshine. I hope it's um, sunny where you are too. Well this morning we're going to begin a new series because as you remember last week John looked at the letter Z. God is zealous for his name and that brings our study of the alphabet to a close. So we're going to have a look at something else this morning. We're going to look at the life of somebody who was Jesus' friend. We're going to look at a, a man whose name was Hudson Taylor. Now, can I ask you a question? Do you like dressing up? If you do, what's your favourite costume? Now, I, I like running, so sometimes I put on a, a running costume. Or if I'm riding my bike, I might put on a cyclist costume. But Hudson dressed like a, a Chinese person would dress. Someone who lived in China perhaps a long time ago. Here he is, look, this is Hudson Taylor. And he's wearing Chinese dress because he lived in China. He travelled there on a, a five month long boat journey. If you can see this map, you can see the UK here and you can see how far he had to travel 
on his boat journey to get from Liverpool in the UK to Shanghai in China. Now he travelled there because he was Jesus's friend and he wanted people in China to know about Jesus too. In our Sunday school lessons, we learn that Jesus is God and that he created everything and we shall love him and trust him and pray to him. And we know all this from reading the Bible. But the people in China had not heard about Jesus and they'd never even seen a Bible. And Hudson knew that it was so important to teach as many people as he possibly could about Jesus. Now he knew that if he wore the same clothes as he would wear when he was at, at home in England, the people in China may not listen to him. So he um, wore their clothes. He learned the Chinese languages and he ate Chinese food because he knew that his message about Jesus was so important. He did everything he could to help teach people about Jesus. Now, just like it is today, China 150 years ago was a very big country and it had a really large population. I mean, a lot of people lived there. And Hudson realised he couldn't talk to everyone in China because he was just one person, although he had his family with him too. So he wrote letters and asked lots of his friends who lived in the UK to come and join him to travel out to China and teach the people there. Now, during the course of his life, many people came to work with him. You can see here, just a small group of them, and they're all dressed in the same clothes as Hudson. In time, thousands of people came to know Jesus as their friend through the work that Hudson and his fellow missionaries were doing. He knew how powerful and wise and wonderful Jesus is and that being his friend is the most important thing in the world. This meant he did everything he could do to tell others about the message of Jesus. So that's our short talk for this morning. Have a good week and I really do look forward to seeing you soon. God bless. Let's come before God now and pray together. Lord God, as we come before you, we recognise that we come before the great creator God and that by your hand all things were made and by your breath all things are sustained. And we come humbly now into your presence, Lord, and acknowledge your sovereign power and bow our hearts in your presence. Lord, we know daily we've fallen short in living our lives for you that sin still lives within us but Lord we know your forgiveness is complete it is new every day because of what Christ your son has done for us in Christ dying for us we have perfect redemption in your sight there's no barrier caused by sin anymore and no debt outstanding we stand in awe at your sacrifice Lord your love poured out for us through your Son. We thank you and praise you. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity of worship, uh, for the freedom to meet together, although it be uh, remotely at the moment, and that even though we are physically apart, we can feel the warmth of your embrace as we come together before you this morning as your church. Thank you that in worship we can uh, put aside the uncertainties of this world and rest upon the certainties of your kingdom. Your promises are not changeable as those of a politician might be, but they are immovable and eternal. Thank you that we can bring to your feet all the hurt and fears that trouble us and we can leave them there, knowing that your strength and assurance are all that we require. Lord God, we want to pray specifically this morning for the persecuted church around the world and bring before you all our fellow believers who risk uh, harassment, discrimination, imprisonment or even death for simply trying to live out their faith or to uh, worship you. We pray that you will grant them strength, courage and protection from those who seek to harm them because they follow you. 
We pray for guidance and wisdom for when their path seems impossible to tread and hope for a future where they have a freedom to worship you without fear. Lord, may they draw strength from you and from your word. Guide them, O Lord, as you did the early church in its time of persecution, that they would know clearly the hope God gives and know how much God loves them from the words you give us in the New Testament. We pray the Holy Spirit would strengthen them and that even within difficult situations, they would know how to share the gospel, that they would fearlessly tell others about Jesus. Lord God, in your powerful name, we lift up the persecuted Christians in India and Nigeria specifically now. We give thanks, Lord, for how you've sustained them through much hardship already and that your word continues to spread throughout this great host of people through the faithfulness and witness of pastors and believers on the ground there. Please strengthen and encourage your precious believers today. Deliver them from the violent attacks of extremists. Protect your persecuted people and restrain all who wish to do harm. Fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit, we pray, that they may be a bold witness for Christ throughout their nation. Pray that they may receive grace and mercy and know you always as their tower of refuge and strength. Lord, we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Isaiah chapter 38 and 39. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order, because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps it has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back the ten steps it had gone down. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after his illness and recovery. I said... In the prime of my life, must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years? I said, I will not again see the Lord himself in the land of the living. No longer will I look on my fellow man, nor be with those who now dwell in this world. Like a shepherd's tent, my house has been pulled down and taken from me. Like a weaver, I have rolled up my life, and he has cut me from the loom. Day and night you made an end of me. I waited patiently until dawn, but like a lion he broke all my bones. Day and night you made an end of me. I cried like a swift or thrush. I moaned like a mourning dove. My eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens. I am being threatened, Lord. Come to my aid. But what can I say? He has spoken to me, and he himself has done this. I will walk humbly all my years, because of this anguish of my soul. Lord, by such things people live, and my spirit finds life in them too. You restored me to health, and let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. For the grave cannot praise you, death cannot sing your praise. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living, they praise you, as I am doing today. Parents tell their children about your faithfulness. The Lord will save me, and we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. Isaiah had said, 
prepare a poultice of figs and apply it to the boil and he will recover. Hezekiah had asked, What will be the sign that I will go up to the temple of the Lord? At that time, Marduk Baladan, Sodov, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of his illness and recovery. Hezekiah received the envoys gladly and showed them what was in his storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, the fine olive oil, his entire armoury and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said, What did those men say and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied, they came to me from Babylon. The prophet asked, what did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There is nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Then Hezekiah said, to, sorry, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors, predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord, and some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought, there will be peace and security in my lifetime. Have you found the one? The search for the one is a big theme, isn't it, in modern Western culture. Uh, it's a big Hollywood money spinner, uh, the couple who are just meant for one another. And as we watch the film, uh, they both gradually realise that this is the one. All building up to that perfect wedding day and that happy ever after life. Well, it's not just about romantic love. In other films, it is the search for the one who can rescue people from a great danger. Have you found uh, the one in your life? Well, the Old Testament, uh, first half of the Christian Bible, it is all about the search for the one. Uh, the Bible begins in the Garden of Eden and human rebellion and Adam and Eve ejected from God's perfect land and, uh, and then a promise comes, uh, God's promise of the one uh, who's to come, uh, the one who will conquer the devil, uh, the one who will bring us back to a place even better than Eden. Uh, and Noah comes onto the scene uh, and we watch and we wonder, is he going to be the one? And then after him is Abraham and then Moses and then David and then Solomon, but none of them turns out to be the hero that we all so greatly need. Uh, they all mess things up one way or another and they all die. Last week we were looking at King Hezekiah who ruled God's people in the 8th century uh, BC uh, and we saw his great faith under extreme pressure as the mighty Assyrian army uh, threatened to destroy Jerusalem and we saw his trust and his obedience to God. Uh, we saw how God answered his prayers with a great deliverance. And the anticipation is building. Could Hezekiah be the one? Uh, well, the answer comes in this morning's passage. Uh, to understand why Isaiah put uh, these chapters here, it helps us to notice that this is not in chronological order. Uh, chapters 36 and 37 recount God's deliverance uh, of his people uh, from the Assyrians. Uh, when did chapters 38 and 39 happen? Well, 38 verse 1 is vague about it. It just says, in those days. But have a look at 38 verse 6. Uh, God says to Hezekiah, I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend the city. Now, do you see what is going on here? Isaiah is, take, is, talking, uh, is taking us back uh, to the time before uh, the great re rescue that happened in chapter 37. So why is he doing that? Well, I think it's to teach us this. 
if last week's passage might have made us think that perhaps Hezekiah is the great hero, why Zara is now taking us back in time to smash that idea right out of the park. Isaiah is going to show us very clearly uh, that even godly King Hezekiah is not the one that God's people have been longing for. So let's look firstly at chapter 38. And we could summarise chapter 38 as the life and death of God's king. Chapter 38, the life and death of God's king. Well, by the time that Hezekiah comes to the throne, uh, the search for a godly king has been going on for quite a long time. Uh, there was the book of Judges centuries earlier, time of lawlessness, everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. Uh, what was the problem? Well, the last verse of the book of Judges tells us the problem. Uh, there was no king in Israel. Uh, that's why everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And then they ask God to give them a king and they choose Saul to be their king. And yet very soon it becomes clear that Saul is not the king that they need. Uh, but then comes King David and then things start to look a bit more hopeful. He's a man after God's heart. Uh, he loves the Lord. And yet he too fails. And in the end, David too dies. But God makes an amazing promise to David. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, the promise that David is going to have a descendant in his family line who is going to reign on the throne forever. And since that day, God's people have been waiting for that forever king to come. Uh, they thought maybe it would be Solomon, uh, David's son, the next king. He had a glorious reign, uh, but then he too drifted into sin and he too died. And since Solomon, lots of other kings have come and have reigned and have died. So what happens to King Hezekiah? Well, 38 verse 1, he falls ill and things really don't look very good. The doctors are talking in those hushed tones. The treatment options have not worked. They've run out and he's about to go the way of all his predecessors before him. And through Isaiah, God gives him the news that he has been dreading. Uh, this is what the Lord says. Uh, put your house in order, Hezekiah, uh, because you are going to die. You will not recover. And how does Hezekiah respond? Well, he's distraught, isn't he? Uh, verse 10, uh, uh, sorry, verse um, uh, 3, he weeps bitterly. And in verses 9 to 14, he recalls his experience. Listen to verse 10. I said, in the prime of my life, must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years? And surely as we listen to him, we can empathise, can't we? We can hear the sense of anguish in these words. And the thing is that death is not natural. It is not how God made things in the beginning. At verse 12, Hezekiah feels like a, a shepherd uh, lying in a tent at night, his place of shelter. And then the tent has been cruelly pulled out away from him. At verse 13, he feels uh, like a lion is attacking him and breaking all his bones. At verse 14, his cries and his moans are like a mourning dove. He is a man in deep grief. But he is also a man of prayer. Uh, this is the same man uh, who will cry out that great prayer to God that we saw in last week's passage. And here he prays, verse three, uh, remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. Now, it's not a glorious God-centred prayer like the one in chapter 37. Uh, Hezekiah is fixed on his own sorrow and his own need, but our God is so very uh, gracious, so full of compassion uh, to uh, his children. Uh, God is not like the, the sort of strict school examiner 
uh, looking to take a mark off wherever he can for even a misplaced apostrophe. Isn't it good to know that when we pray? Uh, sometimes our words come out rather garbled, don't they? Or sometimes our motivations are, are not really in the right place. Sometimes our prayer is, is not really for the right thing. But God loves to hear his children pray. And in his great compassion to Hezekiah, he grants what Hezekiah asked for. At verse four, he adds 15 years to Hezekiah's life. He promises Hezekiah victory over the Assyrians. And he even gives Hezekiah a miraculous sign uh, to help Hezekiah believe that his promise is real. And in verse 15 to 20, he rejoices, Hezekiah rejoices in God's kindness to him. At verse 17, he even realises with the benefit of hindsight uh, that God has allowed him to go through this ordeal for his own good. Uh, verses 18 and 19 shows that his, his understanding is somewhat limited. Uh, Jesus has not yet come and risen from the dead and Hezekiah's grasp of life beyond the grave is uh, somewhat patchy. But verse 20, uh, what God has done for him leads him to joyful praise. So what are we to make of chapter 38? Well, we ought to mention that God nowhere promises in the Bible uh, that he's going to bring these kinds of healings if we pray with enough faith. Uh, God may choose to answer our weak and stuttering prayers. Uh, sometimes he does do that. Uh, sometimes he does grant physical healing, even miraculously, as he did for Hezekiah, but the Bible never promises that. But as we put chapter 38 together, uh, what do we see? Well, it is an account of life and death. Hezekiah, at the start of it, is on the brink of death. Uh, God restores him to life. But notice the very precise temporal nature, the time pointer of that restoration. Fifteen years. Precisely 15 years. Only 15 years. It's a bit like if you can imagine a doctor's appointment where you are fearing you're going to hear the worst. And then the doctor gives you the all clear and it's like a great burden has been lifted off your back. Uh, but the doctor says, uh, we do have something else that I need to tell you, something else that's not right. It's not going to be an issue for some time. It's not an urgent thing, but you're not likely to live for more than 15 years. Well, it's a lot better than being given one year to live, but it still leaves you, leaves you with that sense of a clock ticking towards the inevitable conclusion. The Bible is crystal clear that the reason we die is because of sin. Human sin leads to human death. Uh, from Romans chapter 3, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's you and me and everyone. And Romans chapter 6, uh, the wages of sin, what we deserve for our sin, is death. And what God gives to Hezekiah can only ever be a temporary respite, uh, a temporary stay of e execution. The clock is ticking. Uh, next year Hezekiah will have 14 years left. Before he knows it it'll be 10 years and then five years and then one year. And it forces us to ask, do you sense that that clock is ticking in your life? Uh, by rights God could wipe you and me out right now. Every day that he gives to sinners like us is a day of his grace and his kindness and his patience. But the clock is ticking. But chapter 38 is not just about the life and death of a random believer. Remember who Hezekiah is. It is about the life and death of God's chosen king. At the 15 year limit says to us, Hezekiah it is going to go the way of David and Solomon and all of the other kings who came before him. Hezekiah is not the one. Uh, he is not the one in King David's line who will reign forever. Uh, God's people then 
and we today uh, need desperately to have a better king. Uh, we need the one king who can defeat death. We need the one king who can defeat death. Uh, how will he do that? Well, that is what the rest of the book of Isaiah is going to answer for us. Uh, Isaiah is bringing us uh, to the close of the first half of the book uh, to set up how much we need this better king. Uh, a king who will come as a servant. Uh, the servant king is the central character of the next 16 chapters of Isaiah. Uh, the forever king from chapter nine. Uh, remember, to us, a child is born, that great Christmas reading. Uh, he will be called mighty God. The government will be on his shoulders. He will reign on David's throne forever. Well, that king of Isaiah nine is also the servant of Isaiah 53. Uh, the one who was pierced for our transgressions, uh, who was crushed for our iniquities. Uh, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. Uh, by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him, the servant, the iniquity of us all. At uh, the one king who can defeat death, uh, he will reign forever, but he defeats death by choosing to die. Now, unlike Hezekiah, King Jesus doesn't try to hold on to life. He doesn't try to avoid death. Uh, rather, Jesus marches straight into it. He was pierced for my sins and for your sins. Now, the wages of sin is death, we hear in Romans but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, King Jesus's life was cut short so that we might live. Hezekiah was not the one who could defeat death, but his descendant, King Jesus, is the one who defeated death by dying in our place. So can I ask you? How important is the Lord Jesus Christ to you? Is he the top priority in your life, the one? Or is he just one priority among others? Or indeed, is he no priority at all? Is he the one, the only one who can get you through death, that greatest of all enemies? Will you trust in the Lord Jesus? Will you, if you're already trusting him, will you keep hanging on to him? Will you delight in him with joy, your king who gave his life so that you could live? So let's turn now to chapter 39. And maybe at first glance, as you were uh, hearing it read earlier, Maybe it seems to bear not much relation to chapter 38, but Isaiah intends us to see a connection. Chapter 38 is about uh, life and death of God's king. And chapter 39 is about the life and death of God's kingdom. The life and death of God's kingdom. I remember the great Bible promises that God had made to his people centuries before. Not just the promise of a king, but also the promise of a land. In the Garden of Eden, God's people lived in God's perfect land under his perfect kingly rule. Uh, when they sinned, they were thrown out of that garden. But in Genesis 12, God promises to Abraham a, a great land. Uh, in Joshua, God brings his people, Abraham's descendants, into the promised land of Canaan. Uh, but there's always that lurking danger. Uh, God has made it uh, crystal clear that if as a nation they fail to obey his laws, they're going to be thrown out of the land again, just as Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden. Uh, in Isaiah's day, uh, the northern half of God's land has already been overhauled 
uh, by the Assyrian army. And now the southern kingdom, uh, Judah, Hezekiah's kingdom, now it too is on the brink. But as we saw uh, last week, God rescues them uh, from the Assyrians. Uh, and so with godly King Hezekiah on the throne and with those 15 years ahead, well, uh, are they going to stay in God's good land? Well, let's see what happens. Uh, 39 verse 1. Uh, not the Assyrians this time, uh, but another great kingdom, Babylon. Uh, the son of the king of Babylon uh, sends uh, gifts. Uh, he's to celebrate King Hezekiah's miraculous recovery. Uh, and those gifts are carried uh, to Hezekiah on a state visit. And Hezekiah welcomes the envoys. Uh, he welcomes them warmly. Uh, he welcomes them so warmly that he shows them around his palace. Gives them a tour. Look, here's the gold. And there's my spice cupboard. And um, uh, there's my bottles of olive oil. And oh, don't miss the uh, amazing uh, armory that I have and all my other treasures. And they get to see all of it. And then along comes the prophet Isaiah to bring God's words. And it is devastating. Uh, verse five, hear the word of the Lord Almighty. Uh, the time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who were born to who will be born to you, will be taken away. And they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. It is nothing short of a calamity that lies ahead for God's people. Uh, they may have uh, uh, hung on to the hung on in the land when the, Assy the Assyrians came knocking. But when Babylonians come, uh, some of God's people, including Hezekiah's own descendants, will be thrown out of the promised land into exile. Uh, no longer will God's people live in God's land under God's king. Uh, they will be forced out of the promised land and their potential kings will become eunuchs, unable to have children to keep David's line alive. Uh, do you see how Hezekiah's personal experience reflects the experience here of God's people as a whole. Well, think about it. Now, Hezekiah gets a temporary stay of execution. He gets 15 years, but death will inevitably come. And so too, God's people get a temporary stay of execution. Uh, God uh, gets rid of the Assyrian threat, but the Babylonians will inevitably come. Uh, just as the clock was ticking in Hezekiah's life, uh, so too the clock is ticking for God's people in the promised land. Reminds me of the situation in our own country in the time leading up to World War II. Uh, first Hitler took over Austria uh, and the British did nothing. And then Hitler took Czechoslovakia and again Britain did nothing. Uh, they hoped for peace. Uh, the Prime Minister came back from a meeting with Hitler promising peace. But the reality is that the British government were only delaying the inevitable. And as ever, it was Churchill who saw it coming. In the summer of 1939, uh, he said, holiday time, ladies and gentlemen, holiday time, my friends across the Atlantic. But there is a hush over all Europe. What kind of hush is it? Alas, it is the hush of suspense. And in many lands, it is the hush of fear. Listen, no, listen carefully. I think I hear something. Yes, there it is. Uh, uh, there, there it was, quite clear. Don't you hear it? It is the tramp of armies, crunching the gravel of the parade grounds, splashing through rain-soaked fields at the tramp of two million German soldiers and more than a million Italians going on their manoeuvres. Yes, only on manoeuvres. 
Hezekiah's day, there was a hush over the promised land. The Babylonians were certainly going to come. It was only a matter of time. And what can Hezekiah do about it? Well, he doesn't even want to do anything about it. What a sad, what a tragic response Hezekiah gives to Isaiah's words. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought there will be peace and security in my lifetime. Hezekiah, the one no, first half of Isaiah ends with Hezekiah, the one who doesn't care. So what did God's people desperately need? What do we today most desperately need? Well, we need the one king who can bring us into God's land forever. We need the one king who can bring us into God's land, uh, not just temporarily until we get thrown out again, but forever. At the end of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah sees a glorious day, a day beyond the exile, a day to come far in the future, a day uh, that, that the suffering King Jesus is going to bring about. Isaiah 65 verse 17, see God says, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. And Isaiah's words are picked up at the very end of the Bible. Uh, Revelation 21 and 22, again, a new heavens and a new earth. That is what is coming. Uh, God's people delighting in living in God's perfect place, God's glorious uh, forever place. Uh, God will be with us, uh, living among us. Uh, Jesus will be there. Revelation calls Jesus the Lamb. Uh, that is the one who is sacrificed, the one who laid down his life for his people's sin. Uh, Isaiah's servant king. And we will never forget, even after a million years, we will never forget how much it cost our Lord Jesus to get us there. And when we get there, there will be a wedding feast and there will be the dazzling glory of God for us to set our eyes on. And there'll be the most precious jewels and there'll be a great garden city full of gold and sapphires and rubies. And there'll be a crystal river and there'll be Eden's tree of life that we can eat from and live and live and live. And the clock will not tick again. There will be no more death, Revelation says. When we have been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Not 15 years, but 10,000 times 10,000, 10 times 10,000. Don't you long for that day? Don't you want to be there uh, with God's people, in God's place, at the land, enjoying God's good rule, and his abundant blessings that he'll be pouring out on us? Does that prospect not fill you with excitement? Does that not fill you with thankfulness for our king who gave his life that we might get to live there forever? Is he not the one? Is he not the only one that we really need? May the Holy Spirit work in us more thankfulness, uh, more joy, more eager expectation uh, for what God has in store for everyone who believes in his son, the true and better Hezekiah, our suffering and now glorified servant king. We're going to finish by worshipping God in song and this song is based pretty precisely on those words of Isaiah 53. Uh, so let's sing now in our homes. He was pierced. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions.
Well, let's pray. Let's close our time together now uh, with a short prayer. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a king as your son, the Lord Jesus. We praise you and thank you so much, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to suffer. Even though you are the king of kings, the king of the universe, we thank you that you chose to be pierced for our transgressions. Thank you that you chose to take all our sin and all the wrath we deserve on your shoulders. Uh, thank you, loving Lord Jesus, that through your death, you have defeated death for us. We praise you and thank you for that promise of the new heavens and new earth, that perfect land that is to come. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the one who brings us there. You, Lord Jesus, are the one. You are the king. You are our king. Please would you help us to delight in you and to delight in you alone. Amen. Well, thank you very much for watching this morning. Hope to see you again soon.